You want the noise brought on you? Because here it comes. What? The noise. All right, guys, we're going to bring in our guest for today's episode. Uh, he is an MMA fighter, Oluwale Bamgoshe. Welcome to The Noise, man. Thank you. What's up, you guys? Glad, thanks for having me. Appreciate you guys. Great. Yeah, so, you know, let, let's jump right into it. Um, obviously, the career in professional fighting, uh, something that, you know, we've been talking to some fighters and really, you know, it was most, one of the most interesting things to really learn about is, you know, what is preparing for a fight like for you? What's your fight week look like? You know, how difficult is, is cutting weight? And, you know, what's that like mentally and physically for you? So uh, preparing for a fight consists of a lot of things. Uh, number one, obviously, our preparation, our studying aspect, you know, watching film on your opponent, um, doing the homework uh, about where what gym you to be trained at, you know, his weaknesses, his strengths. Um, and then, obviously, what gym and or what coaches you're going to have in your corner to prepare um, for, uh, for this opponent. Uh, and then you have meal, meal prepping, obviously. You have cutting weight, which pertains to, you know, different methods. You know, using towels, you know, a bunch of towels on you, you know, sauna, steam room, um, spit techniques, spitting in bottles. By the way, cutting weight sucks. Um, <laughs> cutting weight is something that I did, but I didn't do. I didn't do a lot. Um, I, I fought. I took a very uh, natural martial art martial artist approach, in the sense that um, I already figured that I'm a very defined fighter and or athlete. So I didn't want to deplete myself by cutting more weight. So I decided to fight at my natural weight because of that. Because for me, the the science behind cutting weight is because there's fat to cut, right? But I'm, I was shredded as fuck. Excuse my language. I, I was no, no worries. I'm like, you know, I don't want to lose any more. What, what am I going to lose? Muscle. So I'm like, screw that. I, I don't mind fighting the bigger guy. But it would have been better if I, if I had better, you know, cutting, you know, weight cutting techniques. But nonetheless, I don't regret, you know, fighting bigger guys. Uh, it's just that there's a lot of things that go into not making mistakes when you fight bigger guys. You know what I mean? Like, your margin for error is very small. Right. So yeah, like, um, but cutting weight wasn't a, a very major, major uh, factor in my fight career. It was just preparing, you know, watching film on my opponent, having the right coaches, making sure I have the right gym, uh, and essentially the right training camp as well too, eating the right foods, and getting the right sleep as well too. That's important, you know, you don't want to overtrain, you know, you don't want to train six hours a day, and you know, you're not resting, you know, so, um, and then also the babysitting aspect of uh, your, 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 your body, you know, making sure you're healing your wounds, um, you know, using CBD oils, you know, um, buying massagers, all this kind of stuff plays into, uh, you know, in my opinion, a, a huge factor into the development of a, of a fighter's durability. Yeah, no, definitely. It's very, uh, it's a very rigorous and a hard lifestyle to live. You know, you, there's a lot more that goes into it than just getting into a cage and, and fighting for, however long uh my first question for you is what was the first mixed martial art you got involved in because i know you you're you're a, a high rank in a lot of different mar martial arts uh black black sash black sash and kung fu uh black belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu green belt in shotokan karate black belt in taekwondo um wh which one did you really start in and maybe if you have a favorite which one's your favorite um so i started off with karate um, mm -hmm. and then I, uh, karate was around 12, and then I officially started um, when, I, when I was about 16 in Taekwondo. So Taekwondo was one of those martial arts I just picked up because it was right near my house, and I just wanted mm -hmm. to get out there. I was like, you know, I, I got an itch, I got a scratch. This is before MMA was popular. So I decided mm -hmm. to, you know, fund myself because I had a job at McDonald's at the time. So I decided to pay for my own, you know, school fees for martial arts. And I'm glad I chose Taekwondo because Taekwondo, there's a lot of footwork that goes into Taekwondo, as well as uh, very uh, intense type kicks, kicks that if you practice without the proper training, you could blow out your knee. So I didn't know that until um, years went by. And then I started to gain a, a better appreciation for Taekwondo because it's not an easy art. It's basically boxing, but with the feet. Mm -hmm. After that, I went into, I got into uh, jujitsu, then Muay Thai, and then, uh, and then boxing. 
but uh, my favorite would have to be Muay Thai. Muay, Muay Thai, Thai, yeah. Um, and then um, I would have to say uh, Jiu Jitsu and wrestling for me go in the same in the same uh, the same category. You no, know, both are different styles of grappling, but they're both. Mm -hmm. very yeah, no, they they fuse together very well. I, I've heard, and I haven't practiced any uh, martial art myself, but I've heard jujitsu is a lot like chess. In a way, you know, you're you're, always, you're thinking like ten steps ahead of your opponent, you know. And if you can mix that wrestling pressure with jujitsu submissions, you're you're a force to be reckoned. Yeah, definitely. And you know, you see a lot of a lot of fighters that are like kind of specialized in in one or two martial arts. And you know, you think being like kind of a jack of all trades is is definitely the uh, you know the way to go. Or you know, what do you think of like some of these more specialized fighters? Um, I think. You know, I think minimum is having one striking or one ground game. That's minimum. So essentially maybe two. But I think to really stand out and to really, you know, embody what a martial, a mixed martial artist is, I think at least three or more, you know, signifies that. And for me, I like the idea of incorporating different martial arts. It's awesome for the fans to see and be exposed to because they get to see a different martial art. And then having, like the creative art behind applying it in a fight. It's fucking awesome. Excuse my language. Like, Don't you know, worry. To be able to practice, you know, uh, three or more martial arts and then so much so that you, you know, included it in your game and, in a, and you were able to display it in a fight, knocking someone out or, you know, just overwhelming them. I think it, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of gratitude and uh, credit to be given to that type of martial artist because it's not easy, you know? Right. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, fighting in front of the crowd and, and being, you know, somebody that you know, excites the crowd. What, you know, what's that like from that perspective? Obviously, um, you know, fighting in, in packed arenas and stuff is not going on right now, but, you know, walking out and, and having people excited to see you, you know, maybe cheer for you. And, and, you know, what's that like dealing with the fans and, and, you know, that aspect of, of being a fighter? Um, man, to be honest with you, there's in the UFC, in the UFC, there hasn't been that I haven't really had a lot of fights where I had a crowd behind my back. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, I had to fight in the, you know, the enemy's territory, which is cool. Well, it's cool or whatever, because, you know, I'm not a coward, but I would have preferred to fight in my backyard. Like, the opportunity to fight in the Garden or the Barclay would have been lit. You know what I mean? I got people in New York. I was born and raised in New York, so, pe you know, people would have showed up. And yeah. to, to feel that, just the idea behind feeling that is is is, is exciting, is exhilarating. Um, so I didn't really get to experience that aside from when I was at ROC, Ring of Combat. Now, Ring of Combat was a substitute to, I guess, that euphoric feeling of having people, you know, just cheer for you and stuff like that. Um, I had people come down and drive all the way to Jersey, to Atlantic City to, to watch me fight, and it was fucking awesome, man. I had them cheer, UFC, UFC. Or, you know, when I get a knockout, everyone goes crazy. Um, but the magnitude of noise is a lot different, you know, when you compare we're in combat to UFC, like UFC is deafening. You literally can't hear shit. I mean, unless your corners are like loud, like uh, aside from that, you're not hearing anything. And in some cases you might not be able to see shit either. I remember when I fought, when I fought Uriah Hall, um, it was so dark and all I could see is flashing lights. And no offense to you, right Hall, but he's black as shit. So I'm like, what the fuck is this motherfucker? <laughs> you know, I'm like, damn. Like, the only thing I could see is his teeth and his eyes. But I couldn't see his teeth because he wasn't really smiling. So all I could see was his eyes. I'm like, damn, wait. <laughs> so I was using the cell phones that were, that were lighting the arena up to, to identify where he's at. But man, it was, it was, it was, it was electrifying, man. And um, that fight, let's say, just to talk about a little bit about that fight, um, Ryan Hall kind of had the crowd on his side. And I knew that because when they introduced me, I kind of got a, you know, like a, a decent, you know, hurrah or whatever. But when they introduced him, bro, like I was literally like lifting off the ground with the amount of cheers that he got. Like there's something very amazing about that. Like when a group of people like, you know, meet in a, a big stadium and they all speak or cheer at the same time, dude, it's spiritually powerful, man, in my opinion. It's just insane, man. It's insane. It, it it is insane, and there's nothing like a packed arena like that. And you guys were in Nashville. Um, I actually remember watching that fight 
because I I don't know for some reason certain certain venues stick out and you're just like oh Nashville that's a weird place for them to be. I know, um, right? <laughs> Nashville, Uriah Hall. Though, I was I was gonna ask you about that fight because uh, Uriah Hall, someone who I always talk about uh, when I introduce someone to the UFC, just because of that knockout that he had on the Ultimate Fighter, I believe, right? That it was that spin, yeah. it was that spinning yeah. kick, right? Yeah. Yeah. What was it like preparing specifically for him? You know, since he's such a high level striker himself. All right. So this is the thing, guys. Like I was saying before, unfortunately, my career in the UFC didn't consist of me preparing heavily. I had little to no time to for some of these some of these guys. And I, I think that's a lot of what kind of made my career a short one in the UFC because um you know when you don't prepare properly for guys like a Uriah Hall, you, 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 there's only one thing that can happen. You're gonna fucking lose. <laughs> so I only had like a week to prepare for him. Can you imagine? And yeah, you know, no. yeah, you see guys like Adasanya, you know, we don't even know who's the first guy he fought. But yet, he has over um, 80 Muay Thai fights and experience than me. So you would think that they would give a guy like um, Adesanya, Uriah Hall, his first fight. But it's, it's all about politics, unfortunately. And not that I'm hating on Adesanya, but I'm just saying, you know what I mean? Like, had he would have fought some of the guys I fought coming in uh, initially, as opposed to them preparing him to fight big names, maybe it would have been a different outcome for me. You know, I, I would if I would have fought guys on my level, um, maybe, you know, with six or seven fights like me, it would have been more of a developmental type of thing as opposed to me trying to fucking survive because Uriah Hall had a wealth of experience compared to me. I, I was 5-0. and oh. He was, I think he was uh, he was 16 and, and 2 or something like that or 16 and 5 or, you know, he had over 12 fights, you know. So, in my opinion, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't even. But, you know, I, I showed up nonetheless. But um yeah. yeah no, of course you know you're you're a fighter and you you show that you're a fighter you know throughout your career, um, but the, we we've spoken about that too that the UFC uh, matchmaking alone and um, they they play favorites I I've said that myself I I could see it you know how people play themselves up online you know it, it seems to be a little more gimmicky, when you were a fighter did you were you able to see through those guys like backstage you know looking at or you not backstage but you know at press conferences or at fights at weigh-ins were you able to see that these guys you know like were just showing up for the cameras, uh, when you say the guys are showing up for the cameras you mean the fighters, the fighters yeah yeah, yeah. um the fighters that are um that I'm going up against or in general. Just in general, because, you know, you, they I, I see a lot of guys at press conferences. Uh, some people say they act a different way in front of the cameras, you know, just to get a rise out of matchmaking maybe or the media, you know, try to get their name out there. Do you think it's more beneficial for guys to be controversial in the sense of, like, acting more like a Conor McGregor than, you know, being a, a typical nice guy like um, – uh, I, for some reason right now, a, name, a name's not popping. Maybe Daniel Cormier. Well, he did have his spat with John Jones, but you know what I mean. Do you think it's more beneficial to be controversial or no? It, it depends. It depends mm -hmm. on, um, it depends on um, how marinated that fighter is in the game, meaning how many fights they had in the UFC, um, and if they were able to make it past the first three fights. Because your first initial fights in the UFC – have to be taken serious or in general taken because if not, they, you'll miss the opportunity. Some guys are fortunate enough to turn down a UFC contract because they know they're not ready. And then they later on, when they're ready, they, they, you know, they reach out to the UFC and the UFC is willing to give them that contract again. But in most cases, the UFC, <laughs> when you say no to the UFC, you missed out. They're not going to get you another fight. So that's kind of like what happened with me. Um, I got my opportunity to fight Hall, and I knew if I said no that, you know, I wouldn't get another shot. So I just said, you know what, there's a possibility I'll lose, but I'm going to fucking take it because, you know, they, they're going to have to give me a, a, another fight and hopefully with a, a better training camp with more time. And that's what happened, essentially. I got a little bit more time my next fight. But that's how it usually, you know, works. But I feel like after the first three fights and that fighter has proven their star power, then they can start acting a fool and, sh and stuff like that. You know what I mean? They can start, you know, um, talking shit, calling people out, things of that nature, because now they have the leverage.
Right. And, and you talk about, you know, short notice fights. And uh, so we, we just, we just talked to Sam Alvey on the podcast and um, you know, you, you, you yeah. replaced him, you replaced him against um, Daniel uh, Serafian. And um, you know, so that's a short notice fight. I'm not sure if it was as short as, as some of your other fights, but you know, how, that obviously you, you mentioned like that's difficult, but you know, how does it feel to get a win um, on, on, on short notice? Yeah, that man, that felt good. And I had more time, at least for Daniel, even though that was short notice too, I had more time for him. But man, it felt great because I, a lot of people don't know, but I, I had an injury where my, my, uh, my knee, my leg was banged up. Man. And I, I can do, I, I couldn't even walk. But I was just like, I need to fight. And I need to make a name for myself. So I'm not saying no to this opportunity. And, you know, it's sad, though, because you would think that at that level, when you have an injury, that it's okay if you call the UFC and your manager and you guys work something out where the fight could be rescheduled where you're more healthy. But unfortunately, in this savage sport, when you do something like that, you miss the opportunity, and then they, they might end up cutting you. You might get cut. You know, they want you to fight when they want you to fight. You know, if you don't have star power and leverage, you can't say no to a fight. And when you do, and when you do have that star power and you say no to a fight, the UFC, they can't do shit. But if, you're, if, you're, if you don't have a name, you have to say yes. You know what I mean? But yeah, that, right. that, that win felt great. That was, a, that was a very good win. And uh, I was able to pay off my student loans uh, with, with, that, with that win. Um, I was also able to, uh, what else did I do? My student loans, and I did something else significant, you know. And it wasn't even that much. I felt like if I were, to, if I was, uh, you know, if I just, if I was just able to stay in there just a little bit longer. I would have, I would have been able to just make the best out of whatever opportunity I got financially, you know. Being, right. Even twenty thousand goes a long way. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, certainly, especially if you got student loans, you know. Ooh, and I was able to pay for my graduate school loans in one shot from that Daniel, Daniel Seraphine win. So it was yeah. amazing. Um, That's awesome. I, I also believe that fighters should get paid win and show regardless, you know, because yeah. there's a lot at stake and there's a lot of bills. So why are we only getting show? If we lose, we don't get the win. Like, it's bullshit. You know, at least in boxing, they get paid show and win, you know, so they go out and they just perform to their best ability. And it's not like you're going to, you're going to, I mean, as a fighter, I, I believe that if you get paid show and win, it's not about the money at this point. It's about the, 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 the sacrifice that was made prior. Right. You know, and, and you came here for the money, but you also came here for the win. So it's a win-win. If you can get the money, show in win, and then you get to fight and, and fight for who's worked the hardest. But in right. the US, unfortunately, it's not like that. When you're dealing with a lot of pressure, when you know, when you got bills and you know there's another man in front of you that 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 could essentially stop you from getting that second half of your pay, I think that's a lot of pressure. I think it's unnecessary pressure, in my opinion. I mean, certainly, I mean, you know, not, not, not that we're experts on, on the UFC's finances or their politics, but, but really, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, in such a mental game, you know, you don't think of it, but you know, even, even someone that's a casual fan, you got to understand the mental game that fighting is. So, you know, and in all sports, but especially in the UFC and, and having that as, you know, as almost like a mental block in some cases, you know, it's that pressure is, you know, I, I believe that don't get me wrong. Like I, I understand that's incredible. Yeah. It's unnecessary. We should be getting paid regardless. As a matter of fact, is, this is a, a, a debate or a, a dialogue I was having with another um, interview, someone, another interviewer who was interviewing me. Um, I was telling them about how there's a, a, a stigma or a, a false misinterpretation about how fighters in the UFC make money. We don't make shit, you know? Um, especially our first fight coming in, especially if you don't have a name. We're talking about you know how much I got for, for Uriah Hall? Short notice? No. $10,000. Wow. Jeez. Can you believe that? You, I could have got, I could have seen an injury that is quadruple the price of that. Yeah. I could have yeah. got an eye injury that to this day I could have been suffering from. Because first of all, yeah. I took a short notice fight, right? Against a killer like that. And I only got 10000 man. $10,000. Can you believe that? In a big platform like that? On, on TV, you know, with sponsors and ten thousand dollars is the only thing that you guys can conjure and give me for taking a, a last notice fight, you know, a short notice fight. Come on, you got to take it after. It's better than that. And to this day, that's the minimum pay. 
And that was Reebok, right? That was under the Reebok oh, deal. So you, yeah, that was with the Reebok deal, but that wasn't Reebok paying us. That was the UFC paying us, and then Reebok yeah. paid us like an additional, a whopping thousand or two thousand dollars. Yeah, so that's my point. You at that point, you you only received ten thousand for that fight, and you weren't allowed to have your own sponsors on your shorts, which is another argument I love having with people that that oh the Reebok deal, blah blah blah. I'm tired of that. I loved. I thought it looked better with the old shorts with the sponsors down the sides, and now everyone's like, oh, not Reebok. I'm tired of it. <laughs> that deal that uh, Dana did screwed us over because it gave us an opportunity to if the UFC wasn't paying us then we can go out and make that money on our own with other businesses, other franchises, and we could bring in revenue for ourselves. But what Dana did, man, he screwed us over, man. And then if you're going to do that, at least compensate us. But he didn't. He did that, blocked us from making more money. And then he's like, listen, this is what you're going to get. And if you don't like it, you don't have to fight, you know? And, you know, it is what it is. But like I said, you know, fighting is, is there's a lot going into fighting, man. And, you know, you got to give credit to these fighters, guys. You really do. Because even the guys fighting now during Corona, Jesus Christ, they're sacrificing a lot, man. And we're not making that much. These, these guys aren't making that much, to be honest. You know, I think minimum pay coming into the UFC, 100K. Easy. Easily. Because that would at least set them, that's, that would set them up to at least being able to have their own place to rest. To, to be able to comfortably pay bills that pertain to gym, coaches, et cetera, and then have a little bit saved up to pay taxes or maybe go on vacation. But that money that we get, come on, $10,000? I live in New York City. How long do you think that will last me? And I have a son at that. Yep. Come on. Yeah. We, two, three we're months. With, on. We're with you on that. We're, we're in Queens right now, so yeah, yeah. We're, with, we're with you on that. God is. Come on now. Yeah. So, we get it. That's ridiculous, especially in a job where you're risking your life, you know, essentially. That, and that's insane. Your long-term health, because I'm telling you right now, there are fighters that have um, health issues from fighting, that they sustain from fighting, that they will forever have. Look at Bisping. Bisping's got a fake eye. He recently had knee surgery. These are, and he's going to have to live with these injuries for the rest of his life, you know? Yeah. And there's fighters, I'm pretty sure, that have similar, if not worse, injuries that they all embraced because they, they wanted to do what they love and that's fine because it's our choice i get it but can you compensate us the way you need to certainly and and you know what i think you know one of the most important things and really you know says something about you of course is is that you know these are the conversations that that fans need to hear i mean like you know people that think that athletes should be going out there doing whatever they want just for their entertainment you know i i feel like fans and and people enjoying the sport watching the sport they got it you know they got to hear stuff like this and you know we appreciate you really coming on and 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 telling us the truth about you know what it's like because you know you know, nobody's interested in, in, oh yeah, you know, we, we shake hands and, and we, we all love it. Bullshit. You know what I mean? Cause it's, it is bullshit. You know, you, you said it yourself, right? So it's, you know, again, we appreciate you coming on and doing this because I, you know, this is something that fans need, you know, need to hear. I feel like. Yeah. They got, you got to appreciate the fighters, man. They're sacrificing a lot and they're not getting paid much in my opinion. The, you know, high, high risk, low reward, man. If you ask me, man, they're not, they're not making as much, you know? And if I would have known that, because, you know, I have a master's degree, you know, and at the time I had a bachelor's. So um, I pushed away my career, um, you know, as far as getting an office, sustaining an office job, because I told myself, you know, I want to be a full-time fighter and I want to be able to focus. But to be honest, in order to really sustain yourself financially with a gig like, like MMA, you need like at least one or two other jobs. And if I knew what I know now, then I would have balanced working in the office setting and fighting because I didn't know I was going to make 10,000 fucking dollars to fight fucking all. Yeah. If I knew that, man. I would have been like, fuck that. I'm, 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 I'm listen, I'm going to be in the office 9 a.m. I'm going to get out and I'm going to go to practice. Fuck that. Because it ain't paying the bills, man. It's not paying the bills. It's not, it's not paying, fighting is not paying, it's not enough. You know right. and, if you have goals to own a house, you know, to own a condo or to take care of your family, you know, you, you, have, you have to, you have to make the right, the, the right decisions. Certainly. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, just to shift the conversation a little bit, um, you know, 
obviously, you know, we know you're, we're doing some training now, but what, what, what are you up to nowadays? What, you know, what's your, what's your schedule like, you know, what, what are you doing life after being in the ring? So yeah, man, um, right now it's just, uh, you know, I work, uh, I have an office job, you know, with the pain, you know, with the pension, 401k, all that good stuff, you know, health benefits. Um, and I also have my gym that I've been able to, you know, sustain for the past two to four years, which is good, um, where I was able to, you know, train guys like Adam, Adam Livingston, you know, yep. the next <laughs> MMA star. Yeah, I met him when he was 15, and uh, yeah, he's been crushing it ever since then. And, you know, now he's a grown ass man going to hospital doing his thing. Um, but yeah, uh, the same in my gym. Um, and then also, obviously, uh, you have training still, you know, still training, you know, waiting for an opportunity. And, you know, I probably have one or two, maybe if I'm lucky, three more years left. And then it's sayonara to the game, you know. But right. uh, but yeah, just just maintaining the art. Um, and for me, it's not about fighting right now. It's about just doing what I love. So just practicing, you know, making sure my body is where it needs to be, you know, um, my techniques are where it needs to be, you know, being a true martial artist, and not one that's you know itching to fight, but just one that uh, his everyday life is, uh, you know. Uh, is to, to, to give to the, the, the martial art that he loves, you know? Yeah, definitely. That's, you know, you know, one of the more admirable qualities, certainly. And, uh, you know, appreciate you telling us. Um, last thing I did want to ask you about is, you know, so we're actually a guy you mentioned uh, earlier, Israel Adesanya, looking a little bit ahead, um, fighting a guy that you fought before, Paulo Costa. Um, what, what do you think of this matchup? If you, you know, if you've been following at all, um, obviously, a, you know, pretty big headliner. And I'm just curious how, you know, how you might think of, of a guy like Paulo and um, you know, what Adesanya needs to do to keep that belt. Um, it's, this, this is going to be an interesting matchup. Adesanya has a, uh, Adesanya is a specialist at striking. So I could easily see him dominating the fight with regards to that. Um, but Paulo is durable and he's also um, a grappler, but he hasn't really shown that, um, that side of his offensive grappling. And I think in order for him to beat Adesanya, he's going to have to take Adesanya down. He's going to have to strike with him, but he's also going to have to mix up some, some takedowns or some jujitsu um, and, and just really bring the fight wherever. Um, because if he just strikes with Adesanya, I don't think it's a fight that he's going to win. I, I could be wrong, but I, personally for me, I don't think – um, I don't think uh, Paulo could could uh, defeat uh, Adesanya uh, striking. I'm not saying Adesanya would knock him out, but as far as pepper him up, you know, ping pong him, you know, uh, you know, keep him on the outside, you know, slip, you know, weave and 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 just just keep him, just be very slippery. Adesanya could easily do that with Paulo. So it, it, the fact could go, you know, it, it's it could go a couple of ways, but I think that like once again, Paulo's game plan has to be to keep that pressure, which he's really good at. And he's going to have to mix it up, you know, strike into takedowns um, and, and use some of his jujitsu. He's a black ground jujitsu. So he's going to have to use that. Adesanya's game plan is going to have to continue to be slick, take his time, use range. Um, and it's going to be easy win. If he can do that, uh, you know, I don't think he's going to knock out Paulo. I don't think he's going to, if he tries to knock out Paulo, he might end up, he might make a mistake. He might have to, the, the way Adesanya beats, um, Paulo Costa is kind of like how he beat Yoel Romero, but with just a little bit more value and a little bit more showboating. But if he can Definitely. do that, it, yeah, he can, he can win. Like being more cautious, well, being just as cautious, but being a little bit more showboating, you know, or being a little bit more, you know, a little bit more value and sting on his punches. And I yeah. think it's a good decision win for, for Adesanya. But Paulo has to shock the world, man, so... You know, he's going to have to prepare his face to get lit up and maybe take a shot to give a shot, maybe knock out Adesanya. That could happen. Or he, if he takes Adesanya down, that could switch the tempo a little bit, tire him out. But it's going to be an interesting fight. I, I can't wait to see it. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what's going to happen. But, um, yeah, it could, go, it, could, it could go one of which way. Let's just, let's just see. Yeah. As a fan, as a fighter, I'm excited. As a fan, I'm also excited. So, Let's see what's going to happen.
Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I said it was the last thing, but uh, you know, I really just, I love that breakdown. I really, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you think of Robert Whitaker and Darren Till before, before we head off. Um, that's another good fight. Um, I like Darren Till. I like Whitaker too. Whitaker, man, Whitaker's got heart, man. And he's fast and his timing is off, like off in a good way. Like he can, he, he'll hit you with speed and power and you won't even know what hit you. And if he does that to Darren Till, uh, Till's in trouble. Um, but Till's got the range, he's got the girth, the size, you know, he's, and he's, he's a good striker too. Um, but I don't see this fight going on the ground. This is gonna be a stand-up battle, for sure. Both guys are gonna strike to death. Um, but Whitaker's, Whitaker's, Whitaker's explosive and dangerous. So Till might get knocked out again. I'm not even gonna lie, but I like Till, so it's like, Keep your hands up, man. If Till can manage to keep his hands up and use that jab, it might be another decision win, just like how he beat Gaslam, because no one expected that. But mm -hmm. if Till gets cocky and he drops his hands, oh, it's going to be a short night. Whitaker's going to knock him out, 100%. Whitaker's going to be gunning for the knockout from the first round if it makes it to the third, for sure. So it depends. It, it depends again. I, I, I can't really go for any guy, but those are my predictions. I, I would say if Till keeps that his hands up and works that jab, he might win the decision. If he, if he drops his hands, Whitaker is going to probably end up knocking him out. Now, if Whitaker is losing the stand-up battle, Whitaker might have to use his wrestling and or BJJ on, on Till. Because I, I think, no offense to Till, I love him to death. He's a cool dude. But I think his grappling is suspect. You know, it, or it isn't his strongest suit. So if Whitaker yeah. managed to take down Till, uh, perhaps if Whitaker can't knock him out, he can win the decision. Definitely. Well, you know, we're going to be looking forward to watching all these fights. Uh, you know, we're, we, we thank you for coming on the podcast and thank you for some of these breakdowns. Oluwale, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you again. Anytime, guys. God bless. Thank you. Look forward to it. And hopefully with this guy next time. We've got to be interested in this guy. Adam, no, he's got a fight coming up, by the way. Adam, tell him about your fight coming up. September 12th. Uh, in Long Island, doing my first uh, MMA fight. So hopefully it goes smooth and I get that W. Thanks to my coach out here. Should be good. Uh, all right, definitely, Adam. We look forward to it. You can send us the details. If your fans are allowed to be in attendance, we'll definitely uh, we'll come out and support. So thank you guys so much for coming on. You got Thanks, it. You got, guys. It. You got it. You got it. God bless. Have a good one. Thanks, Have guys. Good one.